Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, legal correspondent, author, and host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, a show about the rule of law, the law, and the Supreme Court justices who interpret it for the rest of us. I've been watching the high court for over two decades, and I bring all that experience and knowledge to examining the U.S. justice system and democracy. Each episode, I am joined by guests with deep knowledge of the law and policy who help me and you navigate our constitutional landscape. Slate's Amicus Podcast. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Hello, this is Jen Rubin for this week's edition of Jen Rubin's Green Room. In 2016, I read a book that changed the way I thought about politics and about white Christian nationalists. It's a book by Robert P. Jones called The End of White Christian America. And it explained to me why the panic, why this furious outcry from people who thought that Western civilization was collapsing, who thought Christians were victims. I couldn't quite wrap my head around it. And so I called up the author. Robert P. Jones, or Robbie as I like to call him, and he explained it. And in subsequent books, he's explained it even more. And he's helped me understand what's going through the minds of people who would join a movement that seeks to redefine America as only white, only Christian, and the Supreme Court as its tool in implementing a set of values that Americans no longer believe in. He's a warm, wonderful voice. I'm thrilled to have him. So without further ado, here's Robert P. Jones. Welcome to the show, Robbie. Hi, I'm great to be here. I was trying to think back when we first spoke, and I think it was probably 2016. I had read this book. Maybe I had seen a review or maybe I had just seen it on the shelf, The End of White Christian America. And it blew me away because it finally explained to me who these people were and what they wanted, um, and what was happening to them. So for our listeners, what do you mean by the end of white Christian America? Mm. What did that signify? And who are these people that we're talking about? Yeah, well, I, I'll start by just saying, you know, these people uh, in many ways are my people. Um, right. So I, I grew up in the South, grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, um, as a Southern Baptist, which is the largest uh, denomination among kind of white evangelical Protestant Christians in the country. Um, so, but I'm also a scholar of religion. Um, so it was kind of this, uh, you know, really a scholarly sociological look um, uh, at this world that I had really grown up in. And and so when I when I said the end of white Christian America, I meant a couple of things. Um, I certainly, well, I, I certainly did not mean the end of all white Christians. Um, that's clearly uh, not not the case and, and not true. Um, but I did mean that we were ending an era where these cultural institutions that were built by white, particularly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christians, that had so dominated our country's history. Uh, and you know, it, you know, it, it's certainly true that. Uh, you know, really up until the very recent future, if you were in charge of something big and important, whether it's an elected a position, a corporation, um, you know, a major cultural institution, the chances were pretty good that you were white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. Um, and it's really only in the last generation that that's really been breaking down and that those institutions that were just so hegemonic and just behemoths uh, at the local to the federal level um, we're finally starting to kind of lose their grip um, on, on society as, as, as the country uh, diversified. And what was it about their religious doctrine that led to a view of America that was perhaps disinclined to accept democracy, uh, more hierarchical, um, and had a different vision of the one that many of us share, which is we are not defined by religion or race or creed or gender? Well, I, I think this has always been a competing question in American history, right? Are we, as many of our founding documents uh, sort of say on paper, are we are we a place that has uh, you know religious freedom, um, where all religions kind of uh, are you know at the table equally, 
Um, so are we a pluralistic democracy on the one hand, or are we a Christian nation, uh, right? And in particular, uh, a nation that privileges um, uh, Christians of European uh, Protestant descent. Uh, and, and really, th that question, that fundamental question has been with us since before the founding uh, of the country. Uh, uh, you, you know, you and I have talked, I mean, I've, I've got a new book coming out in September um, that really traces this all the way back to 1493, right? Um, and, and so it, it, the version of Christianity that lands on the shores um, of this country is one that, that, you know, on the one hand had this commitment to freedom and on the other hand had this commitment and, and a real understanding of America as a kind of new promised land for European Christians. And explain to us how the ideal of white supremacy or white nationalism got fused with the Protestant church, particularly in the South. Right. Well, you know, I, I, again, I, I think it's remarkable um, when you really look at the history, um, th this idea, again, of kind of America as a European Christian promised land was pretty deep. Um, and, and not just in the South, it was pretty deep. You know, we, we, we kind of remember some of the you know, largest slave markets were in New York and New Jersey, uh, right? Um, and we have to kind of remember that history. So the white supremacy part, uh, in many ways, it's baked in. And, you know, I'll, I'll um, always remember, you know, like, Frederick Douglass's um, first autobiography, he was published in 1845, you know, has this kind of searing passage at the end where he documents this, and he, he just says, you know, the slave auctioner's bell and the church bell rang together, you know, and that they were selling human beings to raise money for the spread of the gospel, right? And this is Douglas's real-time witness of early Christianity um, in this country. Um, and he just goes on and on. I mean, it's, it's a really searing indictment of Christianity as practiced by, you know, European Christians at the, at the dawn of the country. So again, I think it's pretty deep in the DNA and comes down. And then, of course, uh, you know, using that date to be, it's kind of notable. That's the year, uh, the 1845 is uh, not only the year Fred Douglas publishes his autobiography, it's also the year um, that uh, the, the Baptists split between Northern and Southern factions uh, in 1845, and they, they explicitly split, Baptists in the South explicitly kind of broke off by, by wanting to um, have a denomination where um, enslaving other people based on the color of their skin uh, and uh, practicing the Christian gospel were entirely compatible with one another. Um, yeah. You gave me a picture once that really stuck in my head, which was that in many Southern churches, in the stained glass windows, in addition to the Gospels, in addition to Jesus or Mary, there was also Robert E. Lee, that they had basically sanctified the Confederacy. So the recovery of the Confederacy, the recovery of this lost cause myth, and the preservation of Christianity became really intertwined in a way that I don't think we fully appreciate today. No, th that's right. I mean, certainly after the loss uh, in the Civil War, and it's worth remembering um, that the Confederacy for Southern white Christians was really seen as the pinnacle of human civilization, right? This hierarchy of white over black um, was seen to be, you know, not just incidental, but a critical part of God's plan for so human society. And then, then you can read sermon after sermon, um, kind of defending this. And then so after the war, um, after the Civil War, there was this attempt to, you know, kind of face defeat, but not admit uh, uh, that that worldview was wrong. And it, it kind of became known as kind of lost cause uh, mythology. And, and many Christian churches, and we should remember here, I mean, I've, I've kind of mentioned the Baptist splitting, but it's worth remembering that um, it, it wasn't just Baptist, every Protestant domination split um, over this issue. And, and it, it's also worth remembering that uh, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, the, you know, Sir Robert E. Lee, the kind of famous general, Jefferson Davis, um, first president of the Confederacy, were Episcopalians. Uh, right. Uh, and so uh, which tend to be thought of today as the more kind of liberal Protestant, you know, branch um, uh, of, of the white Christian world. 
uh, but but they were Episcopalians. And many of these churches that had these images were Episcopal churches. They weren't Baptist churches. They were Episcopal uh, churches. And, and probably the most prominent one, uh, which is still striking, that um, it was only, I think, about five or six years ago that the Washington National Cathedral uh, in Washington, D.C., removed um, these windows that were called the Lee Jackson windows. And they had not only these pictures of Robert E. Lee bowing in prayer, uh, uh, Stonewall Jackson, um, uh, but they had actual Confederate battle flags made in stained glass embedded in the windows um, at the Washington National Cathedral. It's stunning. It really is stunning. So for people who don't subscribe to this strain of Christianity or people who aren't Christian at all, it's sometimes hard for them to understand how people can consider themselves to be good Christians and yet support things that don't seem very Christian in politics or in society. For example, Christianity teaches that you should take care of the stranger, and yet these were the same people who were cheering the child separation, or they believe in um, marriage, and yet they embraced a three times married philandering uh, president. Explain this dichotomy. Is it something more than just hypocrisy? Is there some distinction between their own personal morality and societal morality that is noteworthy here? Well, you know, I, I think in many ways it's desperation, um, you know, and, and what has happened is that um, there's been this this really shift so that, um, you know, white Christians, had, I think, in, have enjoyed this sense that um, there were enough numbers, right, enough of them uh, to kind of hold sway in, in, in public life. And, and I think one of the reasons why we're seeing such you know, this kind of these visceral reactions that seem so counter to a plain reading of the Christian New Testament in many ways, or the example of Jesus, um, is that the, the political uh, world um, that had become so important um, has become very fraught as their numbers have declined. So just to kind of put this in perspective, if we go back just to the beginning of Barack Obama's presidency, right, or when he was running for president, the country, even that recently in 2008, was um, 54% white and Christian, right? So if you put all white Christians together, Protestant, Catholic, non-denominational, uh, what have you, it was 54% white and Christian. Uh, by the time we get uh, to the Clinton-Trump uh, uh, contest, that number had dropped, uh, it was 54%, it dropped to 47%, uh, percent, and that number today is 42 uh, percent, right? So we have moved just from 2008 to being a country that was 54% white and Christian to 42% white and Christian. And that slippage from majority to um, minority status in the country, I think, is what has elevated political victory and sometimes political victory by any means, um, you know, as, uh, you know, something that seems to get the blessing, right, of, of religious leaders and, and particularly white evangelical leaders um, in the South. But, but again, it's worth remembering that, like, there have been other times when these methods were blessed. Um, and I can, you could think of Reconstruction uh, in the South, right? When uh, African-Americans in the South were enfranchised for the first time uh, following the Civil War, white Christians blessed all sorts of uh, violence and mayhem to keep African-Americans from voting, right? And it's only when they sort of seize control with Jim Crow laws and all of that, where in many counties, like, you know, uh, in the Delta in Mississippi, there would be like literally... In a, in a county that was a majority black, zero registered voters, um, you know, in those counties. Uh, only when that kind of control was reinstituted did this kind of return to, oh, yes, we support democracy, um, you know, crop back up. So the, the troubling thing, I think, is that for many white Christians, um, the historical record suggests that support for democracy is contingent um, at best. Uh, right. And, and we're at a moment where um, if the desired outcomes don't seem to be uh, achievable by democratic means, then other means, you know, start looking justifiable. 
And that, to a large degree, I think, explains the voter repression and the voter suppression, which is that they want an electorate that doesn't look like America today, but that looks like the electorate when it was 54% white Christian or earlier than that. So they have to artificially carve up the current electorate in order to maintain the supremacy of a group of people who have traditionally turned out in very strong numbers. The evangelical community since the 80s has been um, high participants in politics. Um, But now um, they are losing the numbers. So this is kind of what they grasp for. That seems to be a bit of what's going on here. Yeah, it's it's also troubling, you know, that in our democratic system where we have basically two viable, you know, political parties um, that that are that these dynamics have aligned really on one side of the partisan divide. And I think that's something very troubling for democracy. So, for example, today, uh, the Republican Party is con- consists of about self-identified Republicans are about 70 percent white and Christian in a country that's only 42 percent uh, white and Christian. Democrats are only about a third uh, white, white and Christian. So they look much more like uh, the country. And so one other way of putting this is that if you take the kind of um, religious and racial composition of the Republican Party and you try to map it onto a timeline uh, or, or to an age group, they look about like 80-year-old America. Wow. Right? Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the racial and, and religious composition of the Democratic Party, they look about like 20-year-old uh, America, right, in terms of their diversity um, and the country's continuing to getting more more diverse. And so we are set, we are setting up this thing where there is this attempt. And, and I think that's why, for example, the, you know, Trump's MAGA uh you know, mono or a chant of make America great again, that the most powerful uh, term was the last one, right? Again, right? This kind of rollback, this nostalgia, right? For this kind of previous time where white Christians had this kind of unquestioned cultural power and political power um, in the country. And I think that's that's really more than more than any other, more than abortion, more than whatever he had to say about immigration. The overall thing was Trump, sort of promising to take the country back, right? Back to this time. Uh, and, you know, and you really have to think it's it, it, that time is sometime in the 1950s, prior to the civil rights movement, prior to Roe v. Wade, prior to um, LGBTQ rights, uh, you know, coming on board. It is this kind of retroactive kind of pull, pulling the country back uh, to this previous time period. Now, I think that's by far the most powerful thing that, that Trump has ever, you know, said in his appeal to uh, conservative white Christian voters. What I find fascinating as well is that when you look at the rhetoric of Republicans today, which in some ways, as you point out, is kind of coterminous with this group, there's a lot of talk about victimhood. Christians Mm -hmm. are under attack. Whites are more discriminated against than blacks. Factually, these are absolutely wrong. Um, They're just factually not true. And yet they perpetuate this um, victimization. Why is that? Why do they f- either feel that way or why do they say they feel that way? Yeah, you're right. And, and you and I have talked about this a lot. And when you could see it in the data, right? I mean, there are like super majorities of white evangelicals uh, and Republicans that will say today um, uh, that today uh, or in America today that, that white people are discriminated against uh, more than. Uh, other minority groups. And even when we ask it not like that, but even ask it in uh, just listing groups and asking people to say how much discrimination each group faces, it is remarkable that like if we put transgender people, uh, Latinos, immigrants, uh, Muslims, Catholics, you know, Jews, uh, and list people who've, who've actually faced historical discrimination and then put white people or Christians in that list, that that white evangelicals will say that they themselves or white people in general are facing more discrimination today all right, than these other groups that clearly have this historic um, you know, record of discrimination. And it's, it's, it's a worldview of, of this kind of you know, victimhood. Uh, but I think it, it, it only makes sense if you realize, so what is the kind of, where's the needle set in terms of their um, kind of cultural outlook? And, and if, if the needle is set back again to this very, very old idea that America was intended to be a promised land for European Christians, 
then, right, everything starts looking like persecution, right? Um, if, but if that's your running assumption and the country is not like that today, um, it, it starts to make sense that, it, that if, if God's will is that kind of Christians of European descent be at the top of the pyramid, culturally, politically, all kinds of power, if that's the ideal, um, then it, it does start looking like, from that point of view, that that's what the persecution, um, I think, is about. And again, it's very, very old, right? It, particularly among uh, Christians in the South, you know, uh, defeat in the Civil War, persecution, right? Um, you know, even, even in schools when I was growing up in public schools in Mississippi, um, there was, you know, a uh, discussion where you would often hear not just the Civil War, um, not just the war between the states, but every now and then you'd even hear people talk about the war of Northern aggression, Right. I mean, that really was the language that gets used. And certainly the federal interventionism to overturn um, segregation. Right. In public schools, um, all of that. Right. Is, again, outsiders coming. The perception is outsiders coming in to sort of change, quote unquote, our way of life. Right. And I think so. I think it has these deep historical roots um, that kind of set the psyche up, I think, to kind of perceive when being asked to kind of pull up a chair on equal terms with everyone else, uh, from this other claim to dominance, that feels like persecution. Right. You're losing something. You're losing a dominance and a supremacy that you really were never entitled to, but they have always assumed right. that they are. Um, right. And, uh, you know, this is why I think you see this crazy sense of victimization. You see it even in the gun culture, where they seem to feel that they need to protect themselves against the government. They have to be armed to the teeth because the real purpose, they say, of the Second Amendment is if the government should come and try to repress them. That's kind of straight out of the lost cause. And, you know, these other people are trying to take my America away from me. I don't recognize America anymore. All that language is really the yeah. language of anti-pluralism. Right. We're not going to have a country anymore. I mean, how many times did we hear that phrase coming out of Trump's mouth with whatever it was, right? If you don't do X, we're not going to have a country anymore. Uh, but one of the things that I think is always worth paying attention to in this rhetoric is that goes by, if you slow it down and you just take every one of those possessive pronouns, right? Who is the our in that, in that sentence, right? Who, you know, um, what does that really mean? We're, we, who's the we, who's the our? And it becomes pretty clear um, if you kind of slow it down and, uh, you know, who, who's, who's losing all of that? Well, it's, it's white Christian people. Right. It's always fascinated me that for people who understand um, perhaps personal virtue or Christian principles for the individual, that they absolutely refuse to recognize that institutions, which after all are made up of people, can themselves be biased or um, unfair. Explain a little bit about that dichotomy, that they don't see institutions, the world outside them as needing uh, a moral cover. It's just their own personal morality, which they can define any way they want, I suppose. Right. Well, there's two thoughts here. I mean, one is to say that there's a kind of theological worldview that has equipped and uh, influences um, uh, particularly conservative white evangelicals on, on this front. And, and that is that there's really this sense of individualism um, that comes from the, uh, uh, the way they think about salvation, right? So if it is the case that I have to repent of my own personal individual sin uh, and sort of confess my personal faith in Jesus as Savior, and that's how I achieve salvation, th that whole uh, way of thinking really is very individualistic, right? And so there's it, it, it sort of filters out or screens out um, the whole role of institutions and the way of thinking about, you know, to put it in theological terms, how could you even think about structural sin, right, or institutional sin if all of your theology is about this kind of individual vertical relationship between an individual and an, ind an ind individual sinner and an individual savior, right? Uh, there really is no room in that worldview for thinking about these bigger institutional uh, things that carry on over time. And of course, you know, it's worth noting that there is... Um, when you have built something like a Jim Crow society, um, it is worth, uh, there is self-interest involved in screening out institutional scrutiny, 
uh, right, and keeping it all about personal piety and personal uh, morality. Um, I'm always struck by um, uh, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, where he talks about his disappointment with white Christian churches, right? And it's kind of an indictment of white Christian churches when he, he says, you know, I'd, I had hopes that we'd have allies uh, in, in white Christian ministers and white Christian churches. Um, but, he, you know, too many have been opponents. Um, too many have been, uh, he says, too cautious, that uh, more cautious than courageous. And then he has this line, which is the one that's always stayed with me. He says, they've been more uh, cautious than courageous sitting silently behind the anesthetizing power of stained glass windows. Wow. Wow. Right. And I think it, it, what he, and what he's unpacking there is this idea that they will sit there, you know, Sunday after Sunday and hear these, you know, passionate sermons about individual sin that have absolutely nothing to say about the injustices outside those stained glass windows all around them. And I could certainly say in my experience growing up, and I, I was this kid who was at church like literally five times a week. I mean, I was there all the time, all the way through, you know, my teenage years and, and everything. And, and I could say, you know, I, I never, ever heard a sermon uh, in all those years and hundreds and hundreds of Sundays um, that would ask our congregation, and this is in Jackson, Mississippi, right, where Medgar Evers, one of the last things he did before he was assassinated was try to integrate white Christian churches in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, that's what he was ultimately killed for. Um, uh, and I, sitting in those churches, uh, you know, nine miles from where he was gunned down in his driveway, that's where my church was, that close, um, never heard a sermon about white Christian responsibility in slavery, Jim Crow, even though we were sitting in a denomination that was explicitly founded to justify slavery. Wow. And I must say, coming from a Jewish perspective, where the entire, um, doctrine is really built around the notion that we are partners with God in repairing the world, in uh, alleviating oppression, in alleviating suffering. This is such a mind-blowing departure from that, that it is hard, I think, for some people who are not from this faith tradition to mm. get their heads around it. Well, there's a real connection point here between that view, uh, right, which is, that's exactly right. And in the Christian, you know, vernacular, you would you would talk about that as building the kingdom of God here on earth, right? That's our responsibility. We partner with God. We build the good, uh, good society here. Um, and it's worth noting that that fell away, particularly among uh, Southern Christians, after the Civil War, because they thought that's what they were doing with the Confederacy and with that middle, with that military defeat, the theology shifted, and so instead of partnering with God to build the kingdom of God here on earth and, and that vision, um, they started seeing society as a completely fallen, uh, sinful place, and their job really was more about individual salvation and a complete disconnect uh, from the social uh, world and for social responsibility. And I think we, we still see the long tail of that um, here today. One of the findings that you see year after year in um, the National Value Survey that your group does, which is a phenomenal yearly survey of, what, 20,000 people on all kinds of issues of morality and faith and um, identification, is that one of the telltale signs of identification with Trump, identification with the Republican Party, and also white Christian affiliation, is this belief that gender roles have gone too far or gender roles have gotten too mixed up. In other words, it seems that traditional masculinity, traditional patriarchy, if you will, is also somehow bound up um, with this idea. Tell us a little bit about what that means and why that is. I'm glad you brought this up because these things are absolutely connected. And I think in order to really understand, you know, this worldview, um, again, it, it, it's important to kind of understand it as a set of interconnecting beliefs. And so beliefs about gender are very much connected to beliefs about race and ethnicity. Uh, and the, I think the, the thing that holds them together is this sense of uh, 
a worldview in which God has sort of created things in a, in a hierarchical, static um, system, right? Um, and so uh, what you say, we've talked about race. So it is, there's a hierarchy to the races, right? And white people of European descent are on the top uh, and other people fall below uh, that. That's the kind of, and, and that is by divine uh, intent. Um, but there's a similar way that that works in, around gender, right? That men are clearly above women and, and divinely intended uh, to be that way. So it, it's sort of tied together with this sense of, you know, a divine, divinely ordained social order uh, where white men of European descent, right, are clearly at the top of the pyramid and other people kind of fall below. And it, the other thing to say is that because it's not just hierarchical, it's static. Um, and there are these bo- clear boxes and you're in one or the other, right? So there's no gender fluidity. There's no racial fluidity. Um, you are white or you are not white. You are male or you are not male, right? Uh, and and so there, there's this sense of kind of needing to sort people and put them in their place and they have to stay in that place. Um, that is also, I think, underwriting a lot of this reaction. That certainly jives with the one drop of blood, which was the right. test for Negroes in the South. Um, and when the yeah. Nazis came and looked, they said, oh, no, that's too extreme for us. We're going to require at least, you know, you have a grandparent. Um, because this notion that they could not tolerate even a drop, um, as if you could measure this, of um, African-American blood, that that would make you, by definition, just as much an African-American as it would if all your parents for generations had all been African-American. So what do we do about this Um, (laughs) when we have a society that is not only no longer dominated by white Christians, but is increasingly seen as non-religion or unaffiliated? We talk about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the people who say none of the above, that these people Um, subscribe to humanism or to some other value system. They look for spirituality elsewhere. How does a society that no longer holds as a majority to those views, that believes in a pluralistic society, that believes that America isn't just for one group of people, what do you do when confronted with this ideology? It's not as if you can reason people out of it or you can present facts that say, oh, no, no, you're really not discriminated against. Blacks are worse than you are, are worse off than you are. How do you approach this? How do you deal with this uh, mindset? Yeah, well, it's, we're, it's a challenge. And we're certainly at uh, this moment, I think, where these visceral reactions that we're seeing in politics and culture are because we are at this hinge point, right? Where something old, an old order is passing away, a new one is coming into being, uh, and it's creating all of this anxiety, uncertainty, anger, violence, um, uh, even um, from predominantly white Christian quarters. So I, I, I think it's worth just kind of noting that's the context. And we, are, and that is the other bookend trend to the white Christian decline that we've been talking about, right? Um, it's worth noting that, that this white Christian decline is, decline is across all sectors. So it's it's not just the sort of like non-evangelical um, uh, white Christians that are declining. White Catholics are also declining. And what's probably most notable is that white evangelical Protestants are declining. So if you look just back against uh, early 2000s, uh, they were, white evangelicals were about a quarter of the population um, just, you know, a couple of, ju- couple of decades ago. They are now, that one group, white evangelical Protestants are 13.6%. That's it. 13.6% of the population, right? So they have dropped from being nearly a quarter to down to 13.6%. That also means that they are within themselves, and it's mostly they've lost young people. So they're seeing the median age of, of that group today is 56, um, right? Um, so they're shrinking and graying um, at the same time. Where are they all going? Well, most of those young people are leaving, and that's the other part of the trend you reference, becoming unaffiliated, religiously unaffiliated, um, a group, yeah, sociologists, sometimes called nuns, N-O-N-E-S's. Um, but these are people that when you ask what is their religious affiliation, they say, I'm either atheist or agnostic or nothing in particular, um, right? And so that group today is at 28% of the public. And we've never seen the number be that high. It's at an all-time high. Uh, but what may be more remarkable than that, though, is if you look at Americans under the age of 30, that number is 40% of Americans under the age of 30, right? And we have certainly never seen that before. So even if you take 
say, the baby boomers and you rewind and put them back into their 20s, uh, they're only about one in 10 unaffiliated in their 20s. Uh, so this generation is four times as likely to be unaffiliated as some older generations were, even if you rewind and put them in, in their 20s where un- disaffiliation or not being affiliated is, is usually at a high point. But, but this is something unprecedented, um, really, and, and as long as we've been tracking these statistics. Um, uh, and, and I think it's a direct, you know, there's a direct relationship between that exodus of young people, the worldview that we're describing, which is uh, just dramatically at odds with the values of Americans under the age of 50, even, um, right? Um, and so there, there's a, a direct relationship between that exodus, uh, the growth of the unaffiliated, and I think a, a, a real uh, uh, relationship between the doubling down that we're seeing among conservative white Christians. It, it's a kind of move of desperation as they see even their children and grandchildren no longer affiliating with the churches that they, that they grew up with. Pete Weiner, who is a good friend of both of ours, is uh, was former advisor in uh, the Bush 43, is a evangelical who's written beautifully, insightfully on this topic, describes what's happened in evangelical churches, that they've become hotbeds of um, crazy QAnon conspiracies, that they've become more like, uh, you know, talk radio than a church, that the churches themselves have lost a sense of spirituality and devolved into these um, kind of, um, you know, devolved down to the lowest common denominator and perpetuate these ideas and these thoughts that have nothing to do with Christianity as well. Um, Is there, if you will, a a reformation going on, um, to borrow a phrase, within the evangelical movement? Are there pastors? Are there congregations that are saying we really have to get back to what was um, the real Christian um, doctrine, the spirit of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I deeply admire uh, Pete, Pete Weiner and his work. And he just said he's a beautiful writer, um, learned a lot from him. I think where I might differ a little bit from his historical diagnosis is I, I do think that the um, the you know spiritual malaise um, goes much further back, and so I if if there is you know a reformation and, and I think there there are some voices out there calling for that, it's going to need to do something more than uh, go back to the 1950s. Um, you know, it's going to need to go much deeper than that because there was a, a you know like I said the, the the Christianity that landed on the shores of this country was deeply committed to colonialism to white supremacy. Um, so it's going to have to be a much deeper reformation than just kind of reclaiming some pre-Christian right, uh, you know, from the 1980s um, uh, rewind. It's got to be, you know, I, I compared it in in um, in my last book, White Too Long, uh, to something akin to, um, you know, a, a bone marrow transplant for a cancer patient, uh, right, where there's not going to be a couple, this is not take two pills and call me in the morning. Uh, it's not get on a better diet and exercise program. Uh, it is something more akin to that because, you know, what happens there is that you literally have to take the person's body back almost to the point of death, right? Um, and you have to kill the immune system, uh, right? So that it knows what to attack, what not to attack. And it it's going to take something more drastic like that if I think white Christianity is going to find its feet. Um, uh, in this in this context, so much of it is there's there's so much historical momentum against that. Um, I will say that um, I've had the privilege of being in over a hundred now um, white Christian churches since the last book came out that have invited me in because they realize there's a problem here and there is a susceptibility and that there and we I'll say we as another white Christian uh, uh, we have built into our faith the susceptibility to white supremacy. We have welcomed white supremacy into our churches. Um, and so uh, there has to be this kind of deeper sense of reckoning um, that's going to require like scrubbing of hymnals, scrubbing of liturgy, uh, scrubbing of stain, literally like reconstructing stained glass windows, right? As we talked about earlier, it's that kind of deep work. Um, that, and, and, you know, the good news is there are Christian churches, white Christian churches doing that. Um, doing that work, um, you don't hear about them as you know because they're mostly doing that work a little more quietly, and it's in their own congregation, their own local setting. 
um, uh, in a way that some of the louder voices are all of the the other voices we've been talking about. But uh, but I think that some of that work is is being done, and I, I'm at least hopeful for what I see going on at, at the local level. And in your book, Wait Too Long, you describe this process of reconciliation, if you will, where white churches um, that in, may have broken from a black church or may have yeah. operated next door to it are kind of rediscovering their own responsibility, their own involvement in slavery and repression and trying to come together in some sense um, for not reparations in the sense of giving something back, but some kind of mutual understanding or acceptance. That strikes me as, um, you know, a powerful experience where that is happening. Um, Tell us a little bit about your new book, which is going to be coming up in September. Uh, Tell us the title. Tell us what it's about. Sure. Um, So thank you for that. Uh, The the new book is um, uh, called The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and a Path to a Shared American Future. Um, So it comes out September 5th, right after Labor Day from Simon & Schuster, um, and in some ways, it, 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 I didn't really intend it this way, but uh, it, it has taken the form of kind of a third book in a trilogy, right? So I first wrote The End of White Christian America in 2016, then a book called White, uh, White Too Long, uh, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity in 2020. And so this 2023 book is, I think, just pulling on this thread. And it, it's, you know, these are all books that are very personal to me as someone who grew up kind of white and Christian in that Southern context. And I really think it's just my continued effort to wrestle this problem to the ground, to really understand it, to see how far back it goes. Um, so in the new book, what I, I do is I look at three uh, locations, uh, one in uh, the Delta of Mississippi, um, it's kind of near where I, I grew up, um, uh, also in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and also in Duluth, Minnesota. And I start with efforts to reckon with uh, the legacy of white racial violence in each of those settings. Um, but behind that, what I quickly discovered, and I think this is what new is new in the new book, is that right behind that story and relevant to that to those stories of Emmett Till or the Tulsa race massacre or a lynching that happened uh, in Duluth in 1921, um, right behind those stories and connected to them is the um, genocide uh, and displacement of indigenous people, right? And these two things don't often get talked about um, together. Uh, and so in each place, I've tried to kind of connect up those stories. And I think what they do is not only kind of get us out of kind of siloed historical thinking where there was, okay, African-Americans have their story, uh, indigenous people have their story, um, and they, they seem kind of disconnected. I mean, sadly, what connects them both um, are really the um, rapacious appetites of white Christian settler colonialists. That's what connects those two things. So by, I think by pulling those stories together, it does turn the lens back around and you say, well, what, what do they have in common? What do they have in common are, um, uh, you know, and you said white Christian European, you know, uh, settler colonialists who were uh, uh, out to claim land, uh, control bodies, um, and were willing to commit violence and justify that violence with a Christian veneer. Um, so I'm trying to tell that story, but also kind of turn the corner, I think, to What's happening uh, in these local communities is that when they are doing this work of reckoning, it is providing, I think, energy and a platform for something new to happen in these local communities. And I think if we're going to turn this corner in the country, it's it's not going to be a top-down thing. It is going to be a bottom-up thing. And so it is that hard work of just one quick example of, you know, a a daughter or a granddaughter of a a, um, land-owning uh, and former in, uh, slave owning family uh, heading up a commission with uh, the grandson of uh, uh, sharecroppers, right? Black sharecroppers and formerly enslaved people in the Mississippi Delta to tell the truth about Emmett Till, right? Um, like that, that work, I think, is creating a kind of social capital um, and some healing, I think, in ways that I think can give us some purchase on this really naughty problem that has been with us, again, since before the Republic. You can really understand then why some white Christians are frantic to cut out this history, to um, ban the teaching of African-American history. They claim that anything that is um, 
accurate to, to fill out American history is somehow saying bad things about America or negative things. And I think um, one of the most important challenges, obviously, we have, which your book demonstrates absolutely um, time and time again, is that we're only going to solve these problems if we understand where they came from and how we got here. Um, and how we got here is painful. It is difficult. And that does create, you know, some soul searching. So yeah. as we end our time together, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about the future? You know, I, I, it may depend on the day, um, I think, but, but you know, <laughs> what's in the news lately? Um, I have to say that after, you know, so I spent time with the book in each of these three places, hanging out with these people who are doing this work on the ground. And, you know, I think that that has done a lot to make me more apt, more optimistic um, because I, I really do see these people facing their own community's history. Now, it's not abstract. It's not out of some textbook. It's things that their grandparents and great-grandparents did, right, um, in these communities and really willing to face that and to try to build a new – and to do it not just to kind of, you know, beat themselves up, um, but, to, but to do it so that we can build a foundation for a different kind of American future – uh, that is more equitable, that lives up to that promise of a pluralistic democracy, which we've always been so ambivalent about. Um, and, and we, my kind of white Christian people, have been so ambivalent about and have a, such a contingent relationship with um, that I, I think that, that, that gives me, that certainly gives me hope. Well, that would give me hope too. We're going to put the titles of all your books in our notes. Uh, and I, in particular, will be on the lookout because um, I read Robbie's books, and then I have to call him up and talk to him about them because we re on every page I have notes scrawled and uh, one thought provokes another and another. So thank you so much for being with us, Robbie, and thank you for all the work you've done in uh, moving us ahead as a, as a country. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you for all of your work as well. I always love uh, talking with you. I feel like I come away smarter. And that was Robbie Jones. You can understand why I find him such a fascinating, thought-provoking individual. And it is so pertinent to what we're going through today at a time that we really are struggling over even the meaning of American history. There are those who want to literally deprive us of a complete view of history as if Black oppression, Black subjugation never occurred. And of course, if it never occurred, there's no white responsibility. There's no white responsibility to fix these things. And it becomes a never ending cycle. So I think you can understand both the depth of the problem, because these are not rational arguments that are assembled through logic. This is a faith. This is a, an, an irrational understanding of race and of faith. You can understand why it's such a difficult problem to solve. But when I talk to Robbie, I'm reminded that we tend to think of things in political terms. What can President Biden do about this? What can a commission set up by Congress can do? And the answer is only a bit. We can change the laws. We can make voting fairer and more accessible, which we should. But the hard work of changing hearts, of understanding the true promise of America, has to come from the bottom up, as he said, has to come from ordinary Americans. So it's a thought-provoking topic. Race is something we're going to come back to again and again on this show. I hope you have enjoyed the program, uh, or if not enjoyed it, at least learn something from it. And if you did, please tell your friends, please ask them to follow on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever they get their podcasts. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.